Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I'm here today to do a Friday Reads video. This is where I wrap up the week in reading and talk about any big bookish things that have happened during the week. This is a huge week for bookish stuff. We'll get to that and then uh, we'll talk about the Friday Reads uh, portion of this video, which, you know, is not going to be as exciting as last week. However, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Uh, if you saw my last Friday Reads video, which will be linked down below, I had a huge reading week. I read five books. It's amazing. I felt really proud of myself. And that did kind of crash this week, but I knew it would. I knew it would. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. First, some big book stuff that happened in the week. And actually, the first thing I want to talk about is this fun guy right here. This was my birthday present from my wonderful husband, Joel. It is a box set of E.M. Forster's books. If you follow along, you know E.M. Forster is probably my favorite writer. I am working my way through his books as part of the E.M. Forster read-along. This was the brainchild of Gentle Librarian. There will be information about it down below. And these are actually from the Folio Society, and they are really beautiful editions of these books. The Folio Society actually did the edition of the Goodbye to Berlin that I got in Pullman, Washington, if you remember that. But it doesn't have the slipcase. Um which is also really beautiful. The same illustrator did illustrations inside each of the books, and they are very pretty. That is E.M. Forster himself. In the read-along so far, we've, done, we've covered the first three books. I didn't actually read The Longest Journey. Feedback on it was not great, and I had a lot of other things going on. But uh, we will be doing Howard's End in July, and I'm looking forward to continuing this. But this was, uh, I just wanted to show this off because it's really pretty, really cool and I am so pleased to have it. It's also very heavy. I'm getting a good workout right now and I'm going to very carefully place it down on the desk in front of me so I get to look at it while I'm filming in addition to myself <laughs> reflected back on my phone. There are two other really big book things that happened this week and then maybe just one note about the channel and uh, something I'm thinking of doing a little bit differently in the future. But the first thing is... Uh, Let's talk about Cormac McCarthy. Unfortunately, he did pass away this week. And it's interesting because the book that people have really been talking about since he died is not the book that I would have guessed. He is a, one of the major American authors of the last 25, 30 years, and uh, approaching 40 years, actually, because, uh, but although I think in the 90s, he really rose to prominence with the publication of All the Pretty Horses. I believe that's the one that really put him on the map. Um, and then he really jumped into the stratosphere with publication of The Road, which is the book that he won a Pulitzer Prize for. This is the book that put him on my radar, and it was the first of his books that I have read. I've read two of his books. And I read this after it had been released for a couple of months, maybe three, four months, but before it won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And that is one of my early, like, attempting to predict the Pulitzer Prize, because it seemed to me, at least at the time, that it was a foregone c conclusion that The Road would win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and then it did. I remember loving this book when it was originally published, I would like to revisit it as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. I'm reading all of the books that have won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and I'm going to try to reread all of the books that I had read before, even though there were a lot that I had read by the time I decided to do my project. And this is one that I think would definitely be interesting to do as a reread, because I was very hot for this book when it was originally published, and it would just be interesting to see if that holds up. I've heard some critiques of this book in particular, but also of Cormac McCarthy in general in the years since, so it will be interesting just to revisit it and see where I stand on it. I am anticipating that I will still like it, probably still love it, um, but we shall see. The only other book of his that I have read is No Country for Old Men. After I read The Road, I was looking for where to go, and around that time it was announced that No Country for Old Men was going to be adapted into a movie, so it felt like the natural place to go. Uh, so I read it before the movie came out. And these, to me, would have seemed like the most obvious choices for people to talk about after uh, he died. Because, you know, No Country for Old Men is certainly up there because of the movie adaptation. The Road did have a movie adaptation, but it's mostly known as the book. <laughs> 
Uh, the film adaptation of No Country for Old Men far eclipsed it. It won Best Picture at the Oscars. Uh, Javier Bardem's performance is still, I would say, iconic. Uh, he played the villain in it. Um, I was a lot cooler on No Country for Old Men than I was on The Road. And this has been an interesting conversation that I've had, especially since I started a booktube channel, because to me... No Country for Old Men is just a bleak book. It's very pessimistic, very cynical, and so is The Road. But I think, no spoilers, that there's a glimmer of hope at the end of The Road that you don't get from No Country for Old Men. But I've had conversations with people online who had a different opinion, like kind of reversal of that. Uh, they thought that there was a, more hope in No Country for Old Men. I, th I think No Country for Old Men is just like very down. Uh, and I, I kind of need that little ray of hope. Um, although The Road is a really brutal book as well. But it's been an interesting conversation. So those are the books that I would have expected people to really be talking about um, as part of his legacy. And, and people have. But for the most part people have been talking about Blood Meridian instead, which was published in 1985. I believe the same year Lonesome Dove was published, and I think I talked about it as another book that was published that year in my Pulitzer Prize deep dive on Lonesome Dove. But this book really slipped by unnoticed in 1985, and definitely would not have been a contender for the Pulitzer Prize uh, or anything like that. Again, it wasn't really until the 90s with All the Pretty Horses that Cormac McCarthy really became a known author. And I believe I saw that uh, for the first time ever since it was published in 1985, Blood Meridian is going to be on the New York Times bestseller list. So this is a book that people have really discovered later and come back to. It's, I would say, a word of mouth hit, except that, you know, I think the the success of a lot of his other books led people back in this direction. Um it's uh, subtitled Or the Evening Redness in the West. I have not read this, but I've had this copy forever. I believe I bought this around the same time I got this copy of No Country for Old Men. But I have not gotten around to reading it yet. Um, I think because these were so brutal and because I've heard that this one is also violent and brutal, um, that I think I needed a break. <laughs> and, you know, that's fair. Um, I don't have a personal attachment to Cormac McCarthy's books, but I know a lot of other people do. And I know a lot of people would say that he is probably the best American author or the most notable American author uh, of the last 30 years or so. I would make a case for Toni Morrison instead, but that's me. Uh, there are a lot of people who would say him. So I'm just curious if you have a favorite Cormac McCarthy book or if you have like a personal connection to his work, uh, it's something that meant, meant something to you. Let me know in the comment section down below because... Um, I think that would be really interesting, and uh, he's definitely an author who could have that kind of an impact on people. The other big bookish news that happened this week is, of course, the Women's Prize announced its winner. I will have my reaction video down below. The winner was Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, and I am such a fan of that book. It was my favorite read from last year. It co-won the Pulitzer Prize, and I have just been rooting for it to have success, and it, it's been a wild year for that. I was really happy about it, and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with the Booker Prize now, because uh, a couple of people in the comments on that video uh, got back and, and said that Demon Copperhead will be eligible for the Booker this year. It was published after the window closed last year, so it was not it's not already passed. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. I think we're running out of luck here. Um, at a certain point, it's people are going to start saying, all right, Demon Copperhead has enough. Let's focus on some other books. So I don't think Demon Copperhead will win the Booker Prize. I don't think it will even make the shortlist. I think the Booker Prize is definitely going to end up looking elsewhere. But I really hope it does at least make it onto the long list. I think it would deserve that. Um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. There was a quote from Barbara Kingsolver in a newsletter that I got from the Women's Prize today. Literature makes our hearts grow bigger, and that's how we change the world. And I love that quote. I think that is very in keeping with her and her style. And I just, I just love it. I'm such a fan of that book, and I was so happy about it. Um, the other thing that will be linked down below is this week I did a video about Time Magazine's uh, Best Books of 2023 so far. 
it was really fun to go through that and um, see what other people have thought about those books. I'm going to do another one of those best of the year so far videos, maybe next week. Um, I also have the mid-year book freakout tag coming. I've actually already filmed it, but I need to edit it and get it posted. So that will probably be coming next week. Just, you know, stay tuned for that. Uh, we're getting into all the fun mid-year stuff. I'm holding on my own best of the year so far until early... The, June has to be over for me because, you know, it's the first six months of the year. I, I, I don't want to do my list until that is over. Uh, so that will be coming as well but later. But it's just fun to be in the middle of the year because all this fun stuff starts happening and coming in. And th then before we get into the actual Friday Reads portion of this video, a quick note. Um, so my usual operating procedure with Friday Reads videos is that I film them on a Friday. It's a Friday as I'm filming this. And then I post them on a Saturday. And I justify it in my head that they are a Friday Reads because I'm filming them on a Friday. What I have noticed lately, uh, not even lately, uh, it, it's been a while. <laughs> um, I really had a reckoning with myself at the end of last year, uh, where I realized I was kind of stressing myself out about, uh, my posting schedule. And I committed to not doing that. Like basically if a day was, re I wanted to film a video, but the work day was getting out of hand and things like that, I would give myself permission to not film a video, like say, all right, you know what? I'll have to film tomorrow. It'll be fine. And I've tried to also, like maybe if I film a video one day, I will allow myself to edit it the next day and then maybe schedule it for the next day. Some a lot, More often than not, I'm able to film and edit the same day and I can schedule them for the following. But, you know, I've given myself the grace to be able to say, I, 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 I'm going to take a little more time on my videos. And some weeks I will get uh, only two videos out. Some weeks I'll get three. It is what it is. Uh, the one that's non-negotiable for me is a Friday Reads. And it's the only one that has a specific day that I need to film it. Friday. It's also the only one that needs to be edited the same day. So I don't have the luxury of filming it going through the rest of my day and saying, you know what, I'm just going to edit it tomorrow and it'll be later than I had intended, but that's fine. Uh, it's the only one that is on a consistent schedule. And what's been happening for the last six months is every Friday is really stressful <laughs> for me. Um, I've mentioned it before, but I have a job that is very unpredictable. I don't know what any one day is going to look like. And I don't know what, even in the morning, I don't know what my afternoon is going to look like most days. So it's kind of difficult to work with that schedule and figure out when I have time to film uh, and all of that stuff. And Fridays in particular can be a little bit fraught. But again, it's just, it's been stressful because it's the only day of the week that I have to film and edit and upload a video all in the same day. And there have been a lot of times over the last month when... I wasn't able to film in the morning and then I have to try to cram in a video in the afternoon and then I have to really like scramble to get it edited. And then I want to start my weekend at a certain point and I have to kind of wait, make sure the video is edited and then uploaded and it just ends up being really stressful. And that's entirely something that I do to myself. However, the solution that I have come up with today, in fact, is I think what I'm going to try to do going forward is film my Friday reads on a Thursday. And that will give me all of Friday to make sure they're edited and uploaded and scheduled. And then I'll probably still post them on Saturday. So actually, Friday is going to be, if things go well, Friday will be leaving <laughs> the equation completely. But I'm still going to call them Friday Reads just because it it is in essence. And it's my channel. I can call it whatever I want. Um, to me, it just kind of perfectly sums up like... It's where you talk about the weekend reading. I should just, maybe I should just call it weekly reading. I don't know. I'll think about that. But um, yeah, so my intention going forward is that I'm going to try to film on Thursday and then still schedule for Saturday. And uh, we'll see how that goes. I think it's going to be a lot less stressful for me. It will be an adjustment period because usually I've gotten very used to filming on a Friday. So a lot of the time I will sort of plan to finish books on Thursday, and that's going to require a little bit of shifting and adjustment, but um, I mean, that part's fine. Um, so we'll see how it goes. That's going to be the intention going forward. 
it shouldn't look any different on your side, except that there will be like a day gap between when I film the video and when it gets posted. But you know, it will be better for me in the long run. So hopefully nothing will look different on your side, but there will be an adjustment on my side just to make it less stressful. And remember, this is supposed to be fun. <laughs> That's why my channel is named what it is. Let's get into the actual Friday Reads portion of this video. So last week I had finished five books. This week I finished one. And that one is a bit of a cheat. It's Let's Talk About Love by Claire Can. Uh, this is part of my Pride Month reading. I'll have my video down below where I um, talk about my pos pile of possibilities. And I was looking for an audio and I thought, you know, th let's do this one. It seems like it would be kind of a fun, a little bit of like a romance. It's YA and uh, it has asexual representation. So perfect. Let's get this done. Um, and I did not like it. And this is going to this is really interesting because I've talked in the past about how sometimes I have will have read a book around the time I was 20, 21, something like that. And then I, I, I've said, I feel like I need to read it now because I think my perspective on it will have changed a lot now that I'm further into adulthood and maybe have matured a little bit and gotten a little bit wiser. And I think the reverse is also true. So take everything I'm going to say about this book with a little bit of a grain of salt because I am not a young adult. <laughs> and I think if you're a young adult, odds are you will probably be on board with everything about this book. It's difficult as a now 41-year-old man, because I had a birthday this week. Um, not, uh, you know, all right. So uh, the premise of the book is you have Alice, who is asexual. In the beginning of the book, she gets dumped by her girlfriend because she comes out as asexual. And her girlfriend really can't understand or reckon with or accept that. So she dumps Alice, and it is very hurtful for her. And in, uh, the main plot is that at work, she works in a library, she meets this guy named Takumi and has romantic feelings for him. There are a lot of different types of asexuality. She has romantic feelings, she just does not have sexual feelings. Um, like, she will want, she wants romance, she's into romance and all that. Um, she just doesn't want a sexual relationship. And that was the breaking point with her girlfriend. Uh, but anyway, so she meets Takumi and uh, she is interested in him romantically, uh, but obviously she's she's afraid to tell him that she's asexual because of what happened to her with her previous relationship. And because in general, she's afraid of telling people who she is because she is worried that people won't understand, which is legitimate because I think a lot of people don't understand asexuality. And again, that is one reason I really wanted to read this book because I'm not asexual. Um, and that I really want to raise my own awareness of what it is and what it is like to be asexual. Because, you know, if you're part of the queer community, we, I think we should at least try to understand each other. Um, we are family in a lot of ways, even though we're very different. So, uh, she's struggling with that. And then the B plots are, uh, she has this really tight friend group. There are three of them and the other two are in a relationship. They live together. They all three live together, but, uh, she's starting to feel very excluded. And it's, and it's natural because they are in a relationship. They're talking about getting married, but she's starting to feel like an extra wheel. And, uh, that, so that's a B plot. And then also her family really wants her to go to law school and she does not want to go to law school, so that's another struggle that she is coming to terms with. And as, again, a for now 41-year-old man, it's a little bit difficult to read a book that is this long. <laughs> it's nine hours. It's not that long. However, I did go back and I looked at most of the romance books that I have listened to on audio are roughly seven hours. Um, and that two hours is interesting, but we'll get to that. Um, so it's difficult as a 41-year-old man to listen to someone go on about these problems that are so self-made. And admittedly, when I was Alice's age, I would have done the same thing. But as a 41-year-old, you want to be like, girl, you have got, you are just getting in your own way all the time. Stop it. <laughs> tell people what you want. Tell people who you are. And don't worry about what other people think so much. All this girl needed is a queer mentor. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And you know, again, 
as someone who is on the other side of that struggle to accept yourself and get the confidence um, to really be yourself and say, you know what, if you can't accept me, then you don't have to be in my life. Um, you know, and this is why little queer people need big queer confidence and they need queer mentors a lot of the time to help them get there. Um, so yeah, all she needed was a queer mentor who would say, listen, if you tell this guy that you're asexual and it's a problem for him, go on now, go walk out the door, just turn around now. You're not welcome anymore. Gloria Gaynor had it right. She needs a queer mentor to tell her that. I think this is the gayest I've ever been in a Friday reads. <laughs> um, but she needs somebody to tell her that, you know, and it, again, as someone who's on the other side of that, it's, it's a little difficult to just have someone keep getting in their own way for nine hours. It starts to feel really stultifying. Like, this is a, is a book that I would say is too long. Now, the real shame of this is, if she had had a queer mentor to tell her all of this information, the book would have been about 50 pages. Like, it would be a pamphlet. Because there would be no plot. And I think I also have a bit of a pet peeve for books where that's the case. Like, if the entire nine-hour book depends on someone not just dealing with things, it really kind of gets on my nerves. And maybe that's because I was that type of person when I was Alice's age, but yeah, anyway. And it's disappointing in particular because uh, the other asexual romance book I read last year uh, by Alice Oseman, which was called Loveless, same problem. Didn't like the characters, and it was way too long. It was actually even longer than this book. I went back and looked. Um, and again, characters are a bit of a problem in this book. Uh, her friends, one of them is like too perfect, and the other one is not very nice. And then it just, they're, the, I, I, could not really get along with the characters in this book. And even Alice, as I said, was kind of infuriating because it's like, girl, you are your own worst enemy. Stop doing this to yourself. And it's hard. <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to be on the other side of that. Uh, and that's why I say it's interesting because I feel like there are a lot of books that I read when I was about 20 that I should revisit now because I'll appreciate them more. I feel like the window for me really appreciating this book closed. <laughs> so this one's the opposite. Um... And I just, I love the idea of an asexual romance because it could be such a great complicating factor, but the way it's been handled in Loveless and in this book uh, just doesn't work for me because, again, it's so many manufactured problems. And yet the book is so predictable because you know what's going to happen with all three plot lines. You know what's going to happen. And then it takes so long to get there. And, you know, you know me, if you follow along, I love a queer romance but here's the thing. Romance books can be very predictable. There's a very set format for them. And sometimes they don't have the, the you know, the fight that breaks people apart and then they have to come together. Sometimes they don't have that conflict. I prefer it when they don't because the conflict usually feels really arbitrary and, again, predictable. Um, so if you're going to have this really strict format, if you're going to be predictable, you either need really great characters or you need to just to be a really charming and sweet book. Um, and this was not that for me. And Loveless was not that for me. So if you have recommendations for great asexual romance, please let me know. Uh, or even just asexual novels. Because the only two fiction books that I've read that are asexual were both romances. And again, there are other types of asexuality. So if you know a book that has good asexual representation romance or not, let me know in the comment section down below, because so far I'm having a really difficult time finding one. And um, I know there are a lot of nonfiction books as well, but I tend to prefer fiction. I, I do read nonfiction, but I tend to prefer fiction. So uh, if you have a recommendation, let me know in the comment section down below. And um, I think even Takumi seems a little bit Disney Prince-ish in a way. Like, he's kind of too perfect, especially in the beginning. Uh, and I, I guess the older, wiser person in me, I, I'm always suspicious of, of Prince Charming types. <laughs> like, uh, every time he opened his mouth and talked or showed up at work with uh, food for Alice, I, I was just kind of standing there like, what, 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 what's your deal, buddy? Where are the bodies buried? I don't, I, I've got my eyes on you. <laughs> you watch your back. Uh so anyway, he's a little too perfect. Um, anyway, I admit I got 
a little more than halfway through this book. And because I was so frustrated with, I just wasn't gelling with the characters. I felt like I know exactly where this is going. And it, there's so much of this book left. I skipped two hours of the book and I didn't miss anything. I skipped two hours. And once I reoriented myself, I was like, yeah, exactly what I thought would happen is happening. And the reason I said earlier that that two hours was going to be important is that, uh, again, most queer romances that I have listened to on audio are somewhere around seven hours. This one is a little over nine hours. There's that two hours. <laughs> so if that was gone, it probably would have been fine. Um, and maybe I'm being really picky. I hate beating up on this book because, again, I think it's really important to have a sexual romance. And if you are a young adult in particular who is thinking that you might be as asexual, representation does matter. So it, th it's really important that a book like this exists. However, I, I will always defend this book's right to exist. I will defend the right of any young adult person to access it and discover who they are and all of that. For me, I just had problems with it. And again, I feel like I've aged out of the bracket for this book. Uh, but it was still kind of a frustrating experience as a reader. But again, I'm not the target market for this book. So take all of that with a grain of salt. Um, but again, I would really, I, I just want a good asexual fiction book. Um, so if you have recommendations, please, please let me know in the comment section down below. The other book that I was working on this week is uh, the same one I think I had started. I, I don't know if I had started. I was about to start it last week. It's Stone Butch Blues by Leslie Feinberg. This is the selection for the Queer TBR Tackle for the month of June. Information about that will be down below as well. This, as it turns out, is a really brutal book really brutal. I knew it wasn't going to be like all a happy book. I knew that the protagonist of the book was going to face a lot of difficult situations, but in within like the first 10 to 20 pages, there are multiple uh, occurrences of sexual assault, um, abuse, and just a whole lot of terrible things. And um, I'm halfway through you can see my bookmark. <laughs> I'm, I'm maybe, it looks like I'm a little less than halfway through, but I'm roughly halfway. Um, I need to take a break because the brutality of the book has continued. Now, this is a good book, I will say. I'm glad I'm reading it. I'm very glad for that. Uh, I think it's an important book because this it, Leslie Feinberg was an early pioneer of uh, transgender representation in fiction. This was published in the 90s. The protagonist does not, at least so far, identify as transgender. Um, they identify as a butch. But I think with the, if they were alive today, and a real person, I guess, um, it feels like they would definitely identify as transgender. Um, the vocabulary for it didn't really exist at the time, and neither did the understanding. Um, and there wasn't as much awareness of like what it meant and... Uh, uh, just of it as an option for someone uh, to embrace as their self and, uh, their, and put, apply it to their understanding of themselves, if that makes sense. So basically, it, it's important. It's good. There's a lot of good stuff in here. You know, the protagonist hardens herself. And I, I say herself because that is at least in the first half of the book, that is how uh, she identifies. Um, she hardens herself in a lot of ways, just to survive, because there's so much discrimination, there's so much hate, there's so much abuse um, that she has to suffer, and that's that's the stone butch part. You ha she has to turn herself to stone just to survive, but she is also emotional and vulnerable and really sweet and romantic, and there's a definite struggle to ad adapt both of those sides and allow them to express themselves. Um, it's just a lot. And if you watched my last Friday reads, you know, um, this is a difficult week for me. I don't want to get into it right now, but, uh, over the next three days, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, uh, we're hitting the anniversary of losing my dog last year. And that is something that has been very difficult for me. Um, so as these difficult three days have approached, I found myself kind of reluctant to pick this up in a way because it's just, 
<laughs> it's heavy. It's really heavy. And I'm glad that I'm reading it. But I, for this weekend at least, I need a break. So I haven't picked it up in two days. And I don't think I'm going to pick it up until next week. Um, Monday is the official anniversary, so probably not even then. Maybe Tuesday or Wednesday. I might not even have picked this up by the next time we speak in a Friday Reads video. Um, we'll see how it goes. I don't want to give up on it. I do want to finish. Um, for my own mental health, for my own emotions, I just need um, a little more space, and I'll come back to it. I'm thinking... This weekend, I'll pick up Wash Day Diaries, which is something that I had seen on Doors at Aldi Books channel, and uh, it's also on my Pride Month pile of possibilities. It should be really short because it's a graphic novel. I think it's less than 200 pages even. Yeah, it's less than 200 pages. So this should be really quick. So this is something I'm going to turn to this weekend, and we'll see how that goes. And then if I need a different book, uh, physical book, from my pile of possibilities, um, I'll do that. I might do a another book, and then circle back to Stone Butch Blues, and I'll decide what that other book is once I'm done with uh, Wash Day Diaries. In terms of audio, so I finished, um, and again, I skipped two hours of uh, Let's Talk About Love Wednesday. Yesterday, I did start another audiobook, but I didn't get very far in it. It's Only This Beautiful Moment by Abdi Nazemian. I had been thinking between, uh, trying to decide, rather, between two different books on my pile of possibilities, um, for what I would do next. And actually, um, Kurt Anderson, who is a viewer, uh, we were chatting and, uh, he mentioned that he had really liked this. And I, I so I decided I'm going to do, uh, only this beautiful moment. I've barely started it, so I can't really say much about it, but I've also seen some really good feedback on this book, um, in some other places. So I'm really glad that I decided to do it. I, I just really haven't gotten far at all. Like I haven't even finished the first chapter. Uh, and again, I don't know what this weekend is going to look like in terms of reading. So maybe I'll, I'll hopefully at least be done by the time I do my next Friday reads, but we shall see. Um, Abdi Nazemian wrote the book Like a Love Story, which I absolutely loved. So uh, I'm, I had been wanting to read another one of his books for a long time, and this one was actually just released. So um, it felt like a natural thing to add to my pile of possibilities. And now here it is. and I, I've begun it, but I haven't gotten very far. So hopefully I'll make some progress on it and at least have a lot to report on next week. But again, uh, when we talk next in a Friday Reads video, uh, I, I might not have had a lot of progress. We'll see. We're going to just, you know, go with the flow and see how everything progresses. And it's going to be what it's going to be. So anyway, that's my Friday Reads video for this week. Uh, as always, I really appreciate your time and your support and all of that. It, it really means a lot. And uh, I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.